Hello, I'm David Hartley, and my fallacy was appeal to ignorance. It's otherwise known as argumentum ad ignorantium, and what it does is when someone makes a claim, it's pushed it, it they they argue that their side is true because there's no proof or way for you to tell them that that's not true. And the key to identifying the, this fallacy is watching when someone makes a claim, and then when you rebut it, they'll try to push it onto the person not making the claim to have to give the proof. So they're pushing the burden of proof away from them and on the, onto the person they're talking to. Uh, one of the famous ones, uh, a more famous argument would be, no one can prove God exists, therefore God does not exist. And so the first part is, they're, saying, they're trying to lead you with saying that since you can't prove he exists, which that's him, that's that person pushing that, that proof away because now someone else has to prove it. And then he follows up with, therefore, God does not exist. And so now they've made their statement and using their logical reasoning, they've pushed it onto you to tell them or show them the evidence of the existence. Therefore, it'll refute the second part. Uh, some examples of a political one might be, uh, if a Republican's elected, then we'll have back alley abortions. There's, there's no proof saying that will be true or isn't true. And so it's pushing it to the person to tell them why this wouldn't be the case. And in a lot of instances, there's no hard evidence that you're going to be able to provide. Um, another one would be, nobody objected to the idea in the meeting, so it must have been a good idea. And that's not necessarily true because... The person that came up with the idea could have been someone much higher up and had more leeway. So the you know the other members were hesitant to tell them why it was a bad idea. There may not have been enough data or information available at the time to refute that idea, and so they you know you would push with the idea on the sheer conscien consciousness that it must have been good because no one said it was bad. And the, the main thing is is that what it's doing is it appeals to the ignorance of the other party. And so that's how you get the argument from ignorance. So when researching it, I noticed that using this fallacy was often used with other fallacies to strengthen their arguments. Um, and a way that they really targeted was wishful thinking. For instance, if someone wants to believe in immortality, then using this fallacy to, you know, approve, you know, use it to say why immortality exists you're more likely to believe it. They're gonna play on that wishful thinking and they're gonna use some other techniques as well, whether consciously or not, to get you to agree with their side. It can also be used to discredit people and is a common tactic. Uh, one that comes to mind is back when George W. Bush had tenure as president, there was that, de that uh, debacle with, uh, I believe it was Dan Rather's uh, CBS. He, he had some papers that said George W. Bush did not complete his tour in the military honorably. And so now he's saying, with that argument, they're saying, okay, I have papers, here's the proof. But they came back and said, well, those are forgeries. And because he could not prove they were forgeries or they were not forgeries, it led it, it allowed them to push the story in the way they went to it. But it could have been, it could have been true, could have been not true. But you don't know because that's what they were pushing is trying to put it back on him to prove they were forgeries. Another thing was that came up was a concern of whether it was good to even teach fallacies. Um, they, they were, there was concern that by teaching a fallacy to students or people, you're helping them because you're showing them how to spot biases and make them better at making sound decisions and using critical thinking. But you could also be making students or people overly critical and you're going to allow them to see fallacies where there aren't any. Which leads me to the second part with fallacies and biases. The, the term is often used interchangeably, but it's they're two different things. Uh, a fallacy or fallacies, they're, they're errors that people make in the decision-making process on arguments or decisions based on logical reasoning that makes sense to them or is easy to connect the steps on. Whereas... A bias is a subconscious belief or motive a person holds on an argument. So where a fallacy might be considered a technique, a bias is something you've been, I wouldn't say, you, you have it subconsciously, it's, it's, you've grown with it, it was either a part of your environment, something to you is on the underlying thing. And so fallacies would play to those biases. 
And then the surprising thing is the study of fallacies is not something new or modern. It, it started all the way back with Aristotle and the there have been about 15, 16 other philosophers, and it still continues on today, uh, where they find more fallacies or discredit old ones or just go on to explain how they're being used. And he wrote he wrote this this work, and I think there was there was two more, and he he concentrated on the different types of fallacies. Um, he he used concepts to explain why they were fallacies, explain how they worked. Um, why they why they are naturally deceptive, and then also numbering and classifying them. But with that being said, it leads me to uh, an example of using appeal to ignorance. And the biggest one is when you're using conspiracy theories, because people that have con when there are conspiracy theories, it's because there's a lack of evidence or information out there to disprove or prove something definitively one way or the other. And the biggest one that came to mind for me was the JFK assassination. It's, it's widely figured that it's a conspiracy because there's a lot of documents that are still being withheld or they're under, uh, they have special security clearances and they're not released by our government, which just adds fuel to the fire of they must be hiding something. And that's the thing, it, they could be, but then again, they may not. It might just be, oh, we didn't want to share how we used policy, like how we how we investigate assassinations so that way people don't figure out an easier way to get around them. It's it's an unknown. And so that right there is your first piece is because it's because they're hiding it, it must be something important or they're hiding something. Uh, another piece was they tried to link JFK being assassinated because his his brother and them he had mob ties to him and his brother had started cracking down on them as a uh, from a judiciary standpoint again it's just using your ignorance it's just trying to use the ignorance of the person making the claim they say okay he was assassinated because of X and you can't prove that it, he had mob ties you can't prove that it was the mob ties that got him killed you can't even prove that it was his brother happened to be reforming and making laws that tied it all back together and it goes on to say you know oh Oswald was a convenient cover or you know, the investigation happened too quickly. If it was a, such a big presidential assassination, how come things moved quickly, people were murdered quickly after they had found out what was going on or they started giving testimony? And all of these things, they use the, this, uh, this appeal. It's a conspiracy theory because of X, and you can't prove it otherwise, whether that's because documents are withheld or key players happen to pass away, and all this feeds into it. And so you have no way... Of discrediting, discrediting the assassin, of discrediting the conspiracy theory, and you can do this with just about any conspiracy theory. They all do the same thing. They play on you can't prove that I'm wrong, so they must be true. And of course, you'll always have both sides of your arguments. That's just how conspiracy theory works. So, what are the implications in IT decision making? So, first thing that comes to mind is when a new system comes up, it would be really easy for a vendor to go, "Hey, this will fix problem X." Have you ever got tired of this old, you're having trouble with your supply chain, this is going to fix it because it does this. And when it's new, there's not a lot of data out there saying that that's not true. So as a decision maker, you would have to be careful to make sure that you're not just trying, you know, you're not that first adopter, you're just going with it because someone told you it's going to work. It may not work. There's, I'm sure everyone in here has had times where your business or someone forced you to upgrade to a new operating system maybe the it was uh, they told you it was security issues it was there was better support they just thought it would work better but there was no proof of that and so this is this this is kind of the same same idea you just have, as you know vendors are going to make their claims they're going to say that this is better because they're trying they have a job to convince you that you should buy it from them or you need to move to this to make it better work better and there's not always going to be a lot of data on the other side saying why it would so just having that healthy skepticism and doing your due diligence and your research before adopting to a new system would really help. Um, we, we read about the case studies, one of the, the issues with creating uh, new software, new ITs, or doing an IT management project would be the silver bullet idea, thinking that this one thing is gonna fix all your problems. There's, there's no proof that that would fix your problem. That's why the silver bullet idea is its own issue because 
you have nothing showing that your single point of failure is this and that by getting system X or software Y is going to fix that. And of course, we at the very beginning of class, you had the, the replication or copying another a business model trying to keep your advantages. It's the same. It, it, that's, a, that's playing to your appeal to ignorance because you can't say why business this business is doing better than you. You can't say just because, oh, Amazon is super lucrative and it's because of their shipping. They do two-day shipping if you have Prime. That doesn't, okay. Or it could be that, that that's just trying to use one piece to tell you why it's successful. And because you don't have it, you must be unsuccessful. And so that's why it's very careful when doing it. And the impacts, of course, are if you're docking these systems and you're trying to copy things just because you've been t you haven't gotten any proof otherwise it doesn't work, you're going to spend a lot of money. Um, you could also end up with an unusable system. You get a, you're in a healthcare system. You decide, hey, this is going to fix it, and it may not be what you needed. You just you went off of something because there was nothing saying it wasn't going to work or it would work. And the worst case, of course, you with all of this, you know, you, you've lost money. Now you've got something you can't use but you still have the same problems and there's no improvement in the process. So I think the, the key to these fallacies and particularly this one is just educating yourself. I, I agree with teaching fallacies because you have to learn how to be aware of them. It helps you keep an open mind and critically think, okay, this is, this is why I want to do it. You know, you have, there's all these other ways of just, you make these logical decisions based on, you know, a plus B equals C, but that's not always the case because you don't have any proof one way or the other. So I think having a healthy skepticism and an open mind before someone tries to sell you something that doesn't doesn't necessarily work or it's not gonna fix your problems, I think that's really the key to identifying fallacies and trying to work around them. That's not to say to be overly vigilant and you know, you're always late to the party, if you will, with making decisions, but it's definitely something that anyone's going to have to look out for, just like any of the other fallacies that you've had to research. So, you know, I went over, you know, how I, what, what kind of research I did and what I found out about it, just some, some examples of, it, what, of what the appeal to ignorance is, along with the, the exercise of the JFK assassination being a conspiracy theory you, by saying, you, you know, this is a conspiracy theory because of this, this, and this, but there was no way for the other side to prove that that wasn't it, it must have been true. Uh, and then finally, the implications of the IT decision-making process, along along with the implications of if you fell prey to it and then potentially how to look out for it. So thank you for your time.